Can President Trump be prosecuted for crimes against humanity? Well, an Ohio Democratic legislator wants to find out. In an article on Ohio Capital Journal, we find out that Ohio Democratic legislator Tavia Golonsky wants to prosecute President Trump for crimes against humanity. Apparently, when asked by the Ohio Capital Journal if she legitimately intended to pursue this action, she said, yes. And here's the tweet. I can't take it anymore. I've been to The Hague. I'm making a referral for crimes against humanity tomorrow. Today's press conference was the last straw. I know the need for a prosecution referral when I see one. This part of the article is fascinating. Sometimes people give comment when they really shouldn't. Just how Golonsky planned to initiate this plan, the representative was not at first sure. I honestly have no idea, Golonsky told the Capital Journal on Sunday evening, but how hard can it be? Indeed, how hard could it be, really, to, you know, file a referral with the International Criminal Court for the President of the United States? Um, apparently, everybody's upset that the President is still recommending hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for the coronavirus, uh, given that it's had some, you know, potential, uh, it seems to have solved a number of cases, or at least there's promise to it. It's not an unreasonable thing to recommend, certainly not a crime against humanity to recommend something to deal with a virus that's killing um, so many people around the world. Uh, you know, and you have to wonder, I mean, again, is she really serious? And this is this is something she's doing. She says, quote, I need every lawyer that did, ever did any work on the international level to contact me at, here's my email. <laughs> People really new to the internet. When we worked on international custody cases, we had a cadre of lawyers working on the case. Suit up! Okay, this is worked on. Wait, you worked on international cases? That's right. She has a JD and an MBA. Where from? I don't know. You know, was it? Who, who knows where? I'm not going to try and look up where she's she's got her law degree from. But uh, she apparently did go to law school, which is weird because you'd think that if you went to law school, you would have some idea about how jurisdiction works, and especially the jurisdiction of foreign bodies over the United States and United States persons. Let's talk about that for a second. What's the International Criminal Court, in case you were wondering? So this is, uh, it tries individuals for genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity. It is investigates and tries people for that. Um, and it's rooted, it's, it's basically rooted in what's called the Rome Statute. That's what, this is the Rome Statute is an international treaty that set forth, that sets forth, you know, what's the jurisdiction of the court, what crimes can it prosecute, et cetera. And so, you know, really quickly, let's start, start here with Article 4, the legal status and powers of the court. It seems, seems like a good place to start. The legal status and powers of the court. The court shall have international legal personality. It shall also have such legal capacity as may be necessary to the exercise of its functions and the fulfillment of its purposes. Here's, here's the more important part, part two. The court may exercise its functions and powers as provided in the statute on the territory of any state party and by special agreement on the territory of any other state. Uh, so that's a really important point. You need to actually be a party to the International Criminal Court in order to be under its jurisdiction. And surprise, surprise, the United States is not a party, as you know, even Wikipedia in this case has it pretty easy. It's not a state party to the Rome Statute, which founded the International Criminal Court. It's interesting to see that very, you know, Democrats have generally been more willing to work with the court, whereas Republicans have generally not been. They see it as an obvious transfer of sovereignty, which it is. It's, you know, ultimately the federal government should be the supreme sovereign over the territory of the United States. But signing on this treaty gives an, gives an international body the right to prosecute American persons in a court that's not in America. That's not necessarily something we agree to. And it's, it's very much is a transfer of sovereignty that other countries have been willing to make, but that we aren't. So. What exactly is, is Representative Golonsky advocating here? Well, uh, she's advocating that somehow uh, the ICC ignore the fact that America is not a state party and prosecute President Trump for the crime against humanity of re recommending hydroxychloroquine. Um, that's, that's fascinating. I think a lot of Americans would suddenly be you know, guilty of crimes against humanity on this basis. Let's, let's actually look. So this is an FAQ about the International Criminal Court uh, to understand it. it's official. And talk about here, under what conditions does the ICC exercise its jurisdiction? Let's zoom in slightly if we could. When a state becomes the party to the Rome Statute, it agrees to submit itself to the jurisdiction of the ICC with respect to the crimes enumerated in the statute. So that makes sense. And to go back to the treaty, if you will, you know, the, the crimes within the jurisdiction, genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes, and I think there's one more. Oh, yeah, crimes of aggression. Um, so... Uh, that's what it's saying. It's saying uh, when you, if you are a party of the statute, then your persons and your country is subject to the jurisdiction. Um, the court may exercise this jurisdiction in situations where the alleged perpetrator is a national of a state party, 
right? So, you know, in this case, say, for example, England is a party to the ICC. Well, English nationals, people, you know, can be uh, brought before the court. Um, also, a state not part of the statute may decide to accept the jurisdiction of the ICC. I mean, I mean that's, that's true almost everywhere. Whenever you have some sort of jurisdictional statute, there's always the option to voluntarily accept jurisdiction. Why you would voluntarily accept the ICC's jurisdiction when they were coming after you is unclear. Um, and finally, th these conditions do not apply when the Security Council, acting under Chapter 7 of the United Nations Charter, refers the situation to the Office of the Prosecutor. So this would seem to be the exception when the ICC could go outside those states that have voluntarily signed up to be governed by the ICC. If the Security Council agrees and sends a referral, they can go after somebody in maybe a country that isn't hasn't officially signed on the treaty. Think about like some rogue African dictator that the Security Council agrees has committed crimes against humanity. Etc. But, you know, there, here's the key point. Here's a key point. There's no circumstance under which an American national is under the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. It's just not going to happen. America is not a state party. And the only other exit strategy is the United Nations Security Council, which America is a permanent member of, meaning we have a veto on any Security Council action. So there's no circumstance under which we, the United States, or any American citizen should find themselves under its jurisdiction, let alone the President of the United States, who has the authority to determine what the United States' position is at the Security Council. Pretty ridiculous. And I knew all this before I, you know, looked into it. It's pretty obvious that this was never going to work. But I thought of something else interesting. Let's go back to that original tweet. I can't take it anymore, says Rep. Tavia Galonsky. I've been to The Hague. I'm making a referral for crimes against humanity tomorrow. Today's press conference of the last straw. I know the need for a prosecution referral when I see one. Think about that for a second and what that means. She is asking an international, a quasi-international body, or an international body, actually, a quasi-sovereign body that has some aspects of sovereignty to prosecute and convict the sitting president of the United States. You know what that entails? It's not easy to exercise jurisdiction over the man, especially if he doesn't want to. So in a sense, it's a, it's a call for ICC prosecutors and ICC law enforcement to remove the president from America, bring him to The Hague, and prosecute him there. You know, I th when I thought that, I was like, that actually kind of sounds like treason to me. And I mean, I, you know, I, obviously it's not the cr literal crime of treason. We can look at it. I mean, the literal crime of treason says, whoever owing allegiance to the United States levies war against them or adheres to their enemies, giving them aid and comfort is guilty of treason. So I wouldn't would say that the International Criminal Court is an enemy that is at war with us. So clearly treason is not applicable. But it seems, it still seemed treasonous to me. And I was wondering if there was a law against that. And, you know, I kind of just did some exploring. And there's actually, you know... It's, it's a lot closer than you might initially suspect about whether or not this person might actually be doing something that is like unlawful in a federal crime by trying to get the ICC to prosecute the president. So I like first I looked at this. This is the a, a collection of sub subversive activities. I love this whole code section. I, I looked at this 2385 advocating the overthrow of the government. And let's look at what it says. Whoever knowingly or willingly advocates, abets, advises, blah, 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 the Duty, necessity, desirability, or propriety of overthrowing or destroying the government of the United States, or the government of any state, territory, or district thereof, or the government of any political subdivision that in, by force or violence, or by the assassination of any officer of any such government, or... So, and here's why I think this is, uh, you know, an advocation of that. Um, because, what, so here's how I'd frame it under the statute, you know, being a, you know, creative lawyering. I would say that what, what she is advocating is... For a foreign sovereign power, foreign quasi-sovereign, to seize the president of the United States and remove him from power. That is, the use of force in order to overthrow the elected president of the United States. That's not a domestic mechanism. It's not impeachment, which there's a constitutional mechanism. It's literally proposing an extra legal mechanism to remove the president. Um, that, in and of itself, could conceivably fit within the terms of the statute. And that's, that's, that's my initial reaction. But, but, important but, we're just playing around here. It's a First Amendment issue. Obviously, it's free speech. You, you, there's a lot of free speech rights. And, and it actually is interesting to read about how the free speech intersected with has intersected historically with sort of what you might call profoundly treasonous speech. Right. Things like advocating the overthrow of the government. Like there are you know, there are some hard li limits on the on freedom of speech, but it is it is just hard to ultimately reach it. So let's start with a case, you know, where, you know, it actually, we kind of see how this law developed over time, how the how the rule, how the First Amendment and these statutes interacted. So uh, Dennis versus the United States. This is a Supreme Court case um, it, where in 51, where the Supreme Court actually ruled that the, the defendant did not have the right to exercise free speech if the exercise involved the creation of a plot 
to overthrow the government. And in 1948, um, 11 communist party leaders were convicted, convicted of advocating the overthrow of the government and for violation of the Smith Act. The Smith Act is actually where I think, a, a, you know, these subversive activities things are like the, the, you know, 18 USC 2385, I think is actually a part of the Smith Act that was passed. Um, and it's, you know, pretty clear that, you know, at the beginning, like people were like, yeah, no, you can't actually advocate file and overthrow the government. That's a crime. We're not going to allow that. Um, in, in 1957, in a case called Yates, uh, you have a slightly, there was a distinction. In this case, you had more Communist Party members uh, being charged with violating the act. And in this case, the Supreme Court voted to overturn the conviction. So it said, you know, there were convictions at the trial court, but, you know, saying you would advocate the overthrow of the government. And, and then Harlan said, look, uh, we think that, you know, there has to be some recognition of the right to free speech. So in, in this case, John, Justice Harlan said, if you are like, you know, advocate, advocating the idea of overthrowing the government as an abstract doctrine, that's fine because that's just ideas and that has to be protected by the First Amendment. But if you actually advocate action, then you are doing something unlawful. So as he said, as he says here, this is a quotation here. We hold that it is not it, it, in failing to distinguish between advocacy of forcible overthrow as an abstract doctrine and advocacy of action to that end. The district court appears to have been led astray by the holding in Dennis that the advocacy of violent action to be taken at some future time was enough. So they're trying to say, look, like if you're just advocating that the government ought be overthrown in the abstract, fine. If you're saying here's how we ought overthrow it, you know, we ought to, you know, put all these people in various places and take, you know, hold people in Congress hostage that, you know, something like that, that could be criminal. And then we move to Brandenburg, the Ohio, and here's where here's the case where it's sort of you know the you know the broad restrictions or the the broad bans on this sort of advocacy come to an end. So this is a landmark case. I remember it from Conline. It's good to read it again. Um, I don't actually I didn't actually remember the content that well, but I remember you know vaguely going over it. Um, landmark case in terms of the First Amendment. It says the gov court the government cannot punish inflammatory speech unless that speech is quote directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. Um, you know this didn't actually. Uh, I'm not sure this dealt with the Smith Act. Um, yeah, no, it doesn't look like it was dealing with the Smith Act. It looks like it was a state law case where you had some KKK person who said appalling things, um, as you see here, like horrible words about. Um, you know, racial minorities, just, you know, a terrible thing, the court, but the court ultimately holds that, you know, the, the, the key holding here is that uh, there has to be the mere advocacy of violence is not, uh, is protected speech. Um, there is, the only thing that is, is unprotected is incitement to imminent lawless action. So to actually go to the case itself, this is Brandenburg v. Ohio, and doing imminent lawless action. Um, Basically, oddly enough, it sort of reads. It, this is something courts do. If you are, if you're curious, they often say that we're reading a, a prior case faithfully, even when they're changing the law. So Dennis did not talk about the need for imminent lawless action. It just said you're not allowed to advocate the overthrow of the government if you're a communist. But here they say, here's the principle: the principle that the constitutional guarantees of free speech and free press do not permit a state to forbid or prescribe advocacy of the use of force or of a law violation, except where some advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and and is likely to incite or produce such action. So that's that's the key thing we, we would have to evaluate any sort of claim about her speech being unlawful. Is it directed to inciting imminent lawless action and likely to incite such action? Now, let's go back and read the tweet again and think about it from that, that two part test. Right. So is it, you know, inciting imminent lawless action? I actually think that that you could make a pretty compelling argument that what she's doing is she's inciting you know, she's asking The Hague, asking the International Criminal Court to prosecute the president of the United States. You can make at least a colorable argument, in my judgment, that that is an attempt to get them to do something imminently lawless and remove him from power and overthrow the government. But here's where I think she gets away with it. Here's where I think she doesn't violate the law. I think that the likelihood <laughs> that the International Criminal Court would ignore its own treaty, which says we aren't going to go after people who are not members of state parties, right? That's that's over here. That's Article 4. The court may exercise its functions and powers as provided the statute only on the territory of a state party or on the territories of other states. Like, the fact is the International Criminal Court is going to laugh at this referral. No one's going to pay any serious attention to it. And so as a result, because it is not likely that it would actually lead to imminent lawless action, it would, you know, the any attempt to prosecute Ms. Golonsky for the speech would would fail the Brandenburg test, and ultimately she's okay. 
That said, it's really funny that like this person thinks she's about to refer somebody to the ICC for war crimes. And you can almost come close to the argument that that itself is a crime, a serious crime against the United States to make this argument. Um, anyway, I found this whole thing quite entertaining. Uh, Ms. Galonsky, you really should probably brush up on your international law, especially for somebody who claims, right, there's, right this, when we worked on international custody cases, somebody who claims to be familiar with international law to, you know, brush up on your jurisdictional uh, understanding and, and your sort of understanding of the limits of these treaties and whether or not we're even a signatory. Um, so that's there. Anyway, so uh, final matters. If you are new here, youtube.com slash human events and hit that subscribe button. I don't see it, but you'll see it when you do it. Um, we're trying to get as many subscribers as possible. We're trying to regularly put out content and your support is extreme, is very appreciated. Um, and, and I hope you enjoyed this video. It's not a crime against humanity to recommend a medicine. President Trump can't be prosecuted by the International Criminal Court. And lucky for this representative, Ms. Galonsky, she's lucky. She just, just barely gets away with it. Uh, she hasn't committed a federal crime by advocating that the ICC seize the President of the United States and take him to the Hague. So thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. And I'll talk to you tomorrow.